Wow, oh, look at that. I got it. Hey, everyone. We're going to be starting up in like 30 seconds to a minute. So even if you don't have your food, uh, you can just like grab it real quick and then sit down. And we're going to start like very shortly. Great. Thank you. The pointer, arrow, mm -hmm. forward and backwards. Great. And you guys, sit, you guys can sit in front too. Dr. Thomas isn't shy, so I'm sure you love to have people come up front. This is fine. Perfect. I'm going to do a short intro. Great. Okay. Yep. Awesome. So, uh, again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to our event today. Uh, we have here with us Dr. Thomas, um, who's who graduated from Wayne State University School of Medicine in 2013, did a residency with O4, that's now Beaumont, with the name change and stuff. But um, yeah, so now he's going to be here talking about direct primary care, what it is, how we got involved with it, and um, he'll answer all your questions and ask you too. So if you guys could give a round of applause for Dr. Thomas. Thank you so much for the introduction. Thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> I'll just start, I like to know my audience. So is everyone here a medical student at Oakland University? And how many first years are in the room? Wow, a lot of you. So the majority of you. Any second years? Great. Uh, third and fourth years? Okay, they're busy on wards and rounds and things like that. Great. All right, next um, poll. How many of you want to go into a field of primary care, family medicine, Internal, pediatrics, maybe OBGYN. Great. So maybe 30 to 50% of you. Excellent. Um, and how many are thinking of specialties? Great. The remainder of you, obviously. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for spending your lunch hour with me. I, I do really appreciate it. Um, what I'm going to present to you is information that I gave to about 100 of my physician colleagues over the summer. There is a Michigan Academy of Family Physicians, and they have an annual conference. And I spoke to my colleagues about direct primary care, barriers to adoption, how to overcome them. And this is kind of a visual representation of a book I wrote on the same topic that's to be released um, probably in October. So I'm pretty excited about that. All right, so um, I own and operate a direct primary care practice in Detroit, Michigan called Plum Health. DPC, DPC for direct primary care. I'm the author of a book called Direct Primary Care, The Cure for a Broken Healthcare System. So you know how I feel about this. Um, the objectives we're gonna define direct primary care, identify and describe some successful DPC practices, and identify some barriers to adoption. So my name is Dr. Paul Thomas, I'm a family doc. I've always wanted to be a family doc. Um, that's not entirely true. Like when I was a child, I wanted to be a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle. But then I realized I wasn't an amphibian and I needed to investigate some other career options. Um, but sincerely, I started volunteering at uh, the CAS clinic when I was uh, 17 years old. And we were taking care of homeless and uninsured folks in the CAS corridor. And I really got to spend time with patients and really get to know who they were as individuals. And that was empowering for me. And also watching the physician who ran that clinic, he, um, it seemed like there was nothing he couldn't handle. And I wanted to have that level of skill and that scope of practice. And so this is me at Open Streets Detroit, a little street festival. Um, it's coming up actually in a couple weeks. And they close the streets and open them to walkers, bikers, and rollerbladers and a lot of fun games. Um, I did go to Wayne State University School of Medicine and I graduated from residency at Oakwood Hospital, which is now Beaumont. And I started my small practice. I say small because we're a one-room office, and we uh, deliver affordable, accessible health care um, via our business, which is Plum Health. Um, I did a TEDx talk in November, and my main thesis is that I believe that health care should be affordable and accessible for everyone. Um, and that's radical because it isn't affordable and accessible for everyone, and that's what I'm trying to address. But I'm speaking to a physician audience, and so we're going to talk about things that matter to doctors. So 54% of doctors say that they're feeling burned out. 
88% of doctors are moderately or severely stressed, and 59% of doctors wouldn't recommend a career in medicine to their children. So how many of you have parents who are doctors? Okay, maybe, maybe 10 of you or so, good. And then how many of you um, uh, have worked with physicians who expressed feelings of burnout to you? Oh, wow. The majority of you. That's surprising, but not surprising, right? And the main things that doctors are concerned about are prior authorizations, right? Um, less and less time with their patients, uh, more and more administrative tasks. Doctors are spending over 50% of their time on administrative tasks, meaning that they're spending less than half of their time actually taking care of their patients, right? This is what the field of medicine has turned into. So what, what happens for on the patient end, they're waiting uh, a long time to see their doctor, not only on the day of, and you, know, you may know what this is like, right? You go to the doctor, you wait an hour uh, in the waiting room sometimes, an hour in the exam room sometimes, and you're, you're seeing the doctor for five to 10 minutes. It's not a great experience. Um, and how long does it take? What's the average wait time to get that appointment with the primary care physician? Does anybody know? How long? Three months. That's a little bit high. Anybody else? How many days? A month. A month is about right. 24 days, according to Merritt Hawkins. Um, and the longest wait time to see a family physician is in Boston, 109 days. It's pretty wild. And so uh, what's this like for uh, physicians, right? Uh, if you are billing insurance in the fee-for-service system, everybody know what I'm talking about, fee-for-service system, you typically have a panel of how many patients. How many patients does a typical family doctor have in their panel? What's that? 2,000 Yeah, 2,400 is the typical panel. And if you want to know how many patients you'd see each day, you'd take 1% of that. So that's 24 patients a day. And if you're good at math, that works out about 20 minutes per patient in that eight hour or nine hour block of time. Nine hours if you take an hour lunch, right? But you know doctors, they're working through lunch. They don't take lunch. They don't take care of themselves. <laughs> Anyways, but the physician is spending, of that 20 minute appointment time, perhaps 10 to 12 minutes documenting everything into an electronic medical record. And this is where it gets kind of radical, but in my opinion, Doctors don't take care of patients, they take care of insurance companies, right? And ensure that the billing and coding is appropriate so that they get paid. In our current system, the customer is the insurance company, not the patient, right? Because look at the ways that we allocate our time. It's a long, dramatic pause. It's intentional. <laughs> okay. So, and, and we're failing our patients, 55% and so a uh, study from the Annals of Family Medicine reveals that patients only receive 55% of the recommended chronic and preventive services, things like managing high blood pressure, cholesterol levels, blood sugar levels, and other chronic conditions. We're failing to order the preventive screening tests. We're failing to refill the medications. We're failing our jobs as family physicians. And so this is not the fault of the individual doctor. So I'm going to say that again. This is not the fault of the individual doctor. This is, these are excellent physicians practicing in a bad system. You know doctors, they're your parents, they're your neighbors, they're your personal physician. They actually do care about you and about their patients. They're just stuck in a crappy system. And we talk a lot about physician burnout, right? Um, who's heard of this term? I strongly dislike this term because it implies that it's the fault of the individual physician. What's wrong with you? You're burning out, right? It's like a light bulb that needs to be changed out. But I th really think we should frame this in terms of a system failure, like a power grid that, that shuts down or like a brownout where none of the lights work really well because the system's overloaded. Okay. Um, to summarize what I've just said, being a family doctor or a primary care physician can be like trying to catch sand, where each grain of sand is a patient concern. It might be your dad's chest pain or your niece's sore throat 
or your sister's pap test or your brother's hand x-ray, right? There are only so many concerns that we can address before these problems start slipping through our fingers. And that's because the volume is so high. Further, I believe that we are slowly losing what it means to be a primary care physician, right? We're losing the soul of medicine, right? Um, doctors have fallen in terms of their stature in the community because um, we're seen as people who churn through patients, not really looking people in the eye anymore, not really taking the time to develop that personal, personal relationship. All right, so we're going to define direct primary care. Direct primary care connects patients and their doctors by using a membership model for healthcare. It sounds really simple because it is. Direct primary care succeeds where the fee-for-service system fails because it removes third-party payers from the relationship. I'll define third-party payers. They are insurance companies like? Yeah, the Bukas of the world. Blue Cross United, uh, Cigna, Aetna. Buka, I don't know. And also, the government payers like Medicaid and Medicare. Great. Um, so this reduces the physician's workload because now I can devote virtually all of my time to taking care of my patients and speaking, <laughs> doing events like this, and then also um, getting rid of those owner's documentation requirements. When I write a note for my patients, it's literally a note about my patients. There's no check boxes. There's no insurance form. It just says, uh, Steve came in with X, Y, and Z. We did this physical exam. We found these vital signs. We're treating him for this diagnosis with these medications. Right? It really simplifies the amount of time that I spend taking notes. According to recent data from Hint Health, about 250,000 people across the United States are engaging with direct primary care practices. And when I started my practice about two years ago, there are about 400 doctors doing across this model across the country. Now there's about 800 to 1,000, okay? Um, states with the highest per capita DPC adoption include Colorado, Maine, Kansas, Washington, New Mexico, Idaho, and Texas. Michigan's what you would call a laggard so I was the second to do it in the state of Michigan. Now there's about 10 physicians and about six practices. So routine medical care for a monthly fee. Um, direct, direct primary care is different than something like, let's say, um, concierge medicine, right? Who here has heard of concierge medicine? Great. Can somebody explain it? Give me a Cliff Notes version of it. One of your hands went up back here. Somebody, concierge medicine? So it's kind of like, essentially, the more you pay, the better service you get, in a sense. Sure. People pay over and above their insurance premiums to have access to a physician 24-7 who can take care of them. Typical cost is about $2,000 to $4,000 per year. And um, they still bill your insurance for the appointments. They also still call medications in the pharmacy and still bill your labs to the insurance. So the prices are essentially still inflated, right? But you're paying that extra money for access. And it is really popular among the top, let's say, 3 to 10% of income earners. So you have to be quite wealthy to afford this sort of plan for your family, right? But the uh, direct primary care model, um, membership ranges from $10 per month to $100 per month. So you're looking at maybe... $120 per year to $1,200 per year. Um, they usually have tiered pricing based on age. And the average adult membership is $82 a month, and the median adult membership is $65 a month. So it kind of falls in here. Well, what I tell folks is if you can afford a cell phone, you can afford direct primary care. If you can afford a cable bill, like you know, cable TV, um, then you can afford direct primary care for your family. It's super affordable. Um, some details. We charge a periodic fee. We do not bill on a fee-for-service basis. So um, unlike concierge docs, they still collect the fee and bill insurance. We don't bill insurance at all. We completely take it out of the equation. And we don't charge typically a per-visit fee. So 
If you're paying the monthly membership, you don't also have to pay when you come in for an appointment. Appointments are included. So you really want to think value over volume, right? In the fee-for-service system, it's the churn and burn. You want to see as many patients as you can because you're incentivized to see as many patients as you can. The more patients you see, the more you bill insurance, the more money you make, right? That's, that's the typical equation in medicine as it stands today. In our model, we bill on a monthly basis, and I'm incentivized to keep people healthy, right? I want them to engage with the service, text me, email me, et cetera, but they don't necessarily have to come in as, as many times as I can get them in the door. So <clears throat> what does this look like in our model? Um, patients contract directly with me, and then we provide additional services like wholesale medications, at-cost labs, low-price imaging services, and remote specialist consults. On a more human level, DPC doctors offer assurance that someone's available for you as a patient. And sometimes I tell folks that um, we're assurance, not insurance, right? Um, if you need to text somebody in your time of need, or if you need to see somebody in a time of need, you can call your primary care doctor, right? In our current system, what happens? You have a primary care physician in the fee-for-service world, but if you get sick and you need something right away, you can't get in, so then you go to an urgent care. Am I right? And so what I sometimes say is that the urgent care is a symptom of our failed primary care healthcare system. Because if your primary care doctor could actually take care of you, there'd be no value in the marketplace for an urgent care. Okay. So this is the typical compensation model for physicians. The patient pays a dollar to the insurance company, and they take 40% of that dollar because they're an insurance company. And then the hospital or clinic gets 60 cents. And then because you have to have billers, coders, um, front desk folks, medical assistants, nurses, your overhead is typically 50% or more, okay? So the doctor is left with 30 cents. In a more concrete fashion, let's say you go in for pneumonia and you're billed a 99214, which is about $130. The insurance company takes 50, your overhead takes 40, you're left with $40. So as a physician, you're incentivized to see more and more patients so you can get more and more $40 deposits in your bank account, let's say. You can see how this is flawed, right? You have a huge overhead. You oftentimes have to have four exam rooms and you stack patients so that you can you know, see the per patient, leave the room, go to the next one, see them. The medical assistant, of course, goes ahead, takes a history. Are you smoking? No? Okay, great. What are you here for today? Let me get your vital signs. That's what the medical assistant does. The physician just goes in and reviews that information, makes the diagnosis, and leaves. Right? Then, you go, then the patient has to go to the pharmacy, then go to the lab area, and if they need nutrition counseling, they go to the nutritionist. Right? You're, you're kind of like, seg you're doing segmentation on what the patient needs. In our model, we throw all that nonsense in the middle out of the window and we do provide our patients with direct access to the physician, right? And, and it really just streamlines billing, right? So I don't have to spend time billing and coding. And then it all allows me to spend all that time that I would be doing that with my patient and take care of them. So we took a Hippocratic Oath. Who here took the Hippocratic Oath on the, the way in? Anybody? Put your hand up if you took the Hippocratic Oath, right? Yeah. <laughs> Primum non notere, right? First, do no harm, okay? And I think we should extend that as physicians to first, do no financial harm, okay? Um, do you know the number one reason for bankruptcy in the United States of America? Yeah, medical billing, right? And John Oliver did a wonderful piece on this where he literally bought like millions of dollars worth of medical debt and forgave it. Right? It's incredible. The uh, New York Times has been talking about putting value on the doctor-patient relationship. There's a recent article that if you have the same primary care physician for a long period of time, your mortality decreases. Right? So there, there's some evidence out there that 
having these sort of relationships with the primary care physician can be really valuable. The essence of the DPC movement, the direct primary care model, is that, that strong relationship between patient and physician. Simply put, DPC restores the doctor-patient relationship, right? Another core belief is that we offer folks same day or next day appointments, right? We, we like value over volume. We like a strong relationship with our patients. We believe that you should have access to your doctor when you need it, same day or next day. So a lot of my patients have been sending me text messages this morning, and I say, well, I could see you at 3 p.m. after I do this thing. And so I have a couple appointments now at 3.30, 3, 3.30 and 4 that I didn't have this morning when I woke up. People just get with me, and I can guide them to the lowest cost service, which is me, right? If somebody really does need to go to the emergency department, they will go. Um, so I'll tell you a story. This Saturday, I was, it was the Wayne State University 150-year gala. We we're celebrating 150-year anniversary, and I was invited to speak about the history of Wayne State. And I got a phone call at 11 p.m. from one of my uh, customers. He's a restaurant owner, and one of his staff cut their finger off. The tip of the finger was bleeding profusely. And he said, do I have to go to the ER with my employee? And I said, send me a photo. So he did. And it wasn't that bad. They uh, sheared off the top of their fingernail. So it was 11 p.m. I asked my wife it would be okay, if it would be okay if we saw them in our office. She said yes. She was pretty excited about it. So she's a veterinarian. So we went in, we saw my patient. We used um, aluminum hydroxide on a sterile Q-tip, also known as dry sol, and applied pressure to the wound until it stopped bleeding, right? That could have been $2,000, $3,000 in the emergency de department, or $150, $200 the urgent care, or included with a membership in our practice, right? And I'm truly happy to do this for my patients because it makes a really big difference for them personally and financially in terms of peace of mind. So what I'm showing you here is the patient, the doctor, and all of the middlemen, right? Um, has anybody heard of a PBM? Okay. Pharmacy benefit yeah, pharmacy benefits manager. And it's, you know, it's like a euphemism. What kind of benefits are you getting with this pharmacy benefit manager? This would be the person between you and your medication, so those folks up there in the upper left. So what they do, let's say you want to fill your lisinopril, and you go to the pharmacist and you pull out your Blue Cross Blue Shield card, and they say, oh, that will be $10, that's your copay for this medication, right? So the pharmacy benefit manager makes sure that the insurance company gets that $10. The cost of that medication, if you went to CVS, is actually four bucks, right? But if you pull out your insurance card and ask for the medication, the, the pharmacist has a gag order. They can't tell you how much the medication actually costs. So you're going to pay the insurance price. So the insurance company just made that extra, um, that PBM made that extra $6. So he keeps that or she keeps that extra $6. That's your pharmacy benefits manager. That's what they do. Do you know how much lisinopril actually costs? One cent per pill. It costs 30 cents for one month supply. And that's what I give it to my patients for. So um, imaging center. So if you go to a, let's say you go to the hospital and you need a CT scan, how much does a CT scan cost? CT scan of the brain. Let's do that one. $2,000. Great. Any other takers? $2,000 about right. Although it's arbitrary, there is no right answer. The hospital can make up whatever they want to bill you, right? The actual cost of that CT scan of the brain without contrast is $300. With contrast, it's $600, right? That's the actual cost. But you're getting an insurance, the hospital marks it up so that the insurance company can discount it and give you a deal. Who does this really hurt? Not the people with insurance, but the people without insurance, the uninsured folks, because they don't, the hospital still marks it up, but they don't get the discount, right? So that's why people go bankrupt who are uninsured. So they go to the hospital, they get treated for stuff, it's $10,000 later, and they had you know, two nights in the hospital, a couple imaging studies, some blood work, and a bag of IV, and they look at their thing, and they say, I got billed $60 for one tablet of ibuprofen. What's going on here? It's the hospital markup. 
Who's heard those stories? Right? Friends, family members, relatives. OK, so in our model, we remove all of this nonsense, right? We remove all of these folks, all these middlemen, between our patients and the doc, who's me. And we coordinate this care for them. So somebody posted on Facebook a photo with this information, and they said, thank God for health insurance, right? Because um, they were billed, let's say, I couldn't include it because it had patient information, and the academy didn't want that. So um, if you don't see this, it said insurance price, and then they paid a grand total of $200 for all these labs on the left-hand column. So I did like a little at cost price. This is what these tests actually cost. And it was 100. So they paid double on what the medications actually, or the lab work actually cost because it was billed through their insurance. So this is kind of like a nice summary slide. Um, medical professionals doing direct primary care, I think that's a little bit high, 1,500. But typical docs have 2,400 patients. Direct primary care, they have about 500 to 1,000. Uh, cost per visit, free with the monthly membership. Visit length. I do spend an hour with my patients initially, and follow-ups are typically 30 minutes, unless they have a lot going on, then we can take an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. Salary is, uh, typical salary for docs is around 200 k In our model, it's based on how many members and at what rate they're paying. And can you use insurance? No, not in our model. We do wholesale pricing for blood work and prescriptions. So I just wanted to run through a couple other direct primary care docs. Chad Savage is in Brighton with uh, Dr. Cook, and they are in, called Your Choice Direct Care. He's an internist, so it can be done if you're not family medicine. Um, Dr. Amat is in uh, West Michigan, and she's also a family physician. Um, Dr. Hellman started in this Rochester area. Um, he was practicing for two years out in Oregon. Now he's back. He started a DPC. Um, my friend Dr. Schumacher is in Indiana. He was practicing for 10 years and then he flipped over to a DPC model. He got burnt out and he wanted to um, try this out. He's been doing really well. One of my mentors, Clint Flanagan, he's in Denver. He has a more of a corporate model where they contract with individual doctors to expand their network. Um, and then, you know, there's literally hundreds of my colleagues who are do doing this and being really successful. So, some of the barriers to adopting this, people are scared about income. How much money am I going to be able to make doing this? Scared to give up certain benefits like guaranteed income, retirement accounts. Um, spouses can be concerned. Um, so I ran through some sample costs, like what does it cost to run this? So if you roll out like, let's say, I don't know, what's the big EMR these days? Epic. How much does it cost to put Epic into your clinic? Half a million dollars, five hundred thousand dollars. Great. Any, any anybody else here? Otherwise, who did you hear that from? Um, yep, and they're probably kvetching like, "Oh my God, can you believe this? Five hundred thousand dollars, and it doesn't help me take care of my patients, right?" Anyways, our EMR is three hundred dollars a month. Malpractice insurance is the same across the board. They're looking at discounting it because we have fewer patients. Uh, my rent for my one-room office is about $600. We buy about $500 worth of supplies each month. We order about $500 worth of medications each month. Um, we do about $1,000 worth of lab work each month. I market my practice on Facebook and Instagram, you know, where all the cool kids hang out. <laughs> at Plum Health DPC, in case you're, in case you're wondering. Um, I travel to conferences, I speak at different events, so I budget for that. Um, my cell phone, so I'll, I don't have like an office phone. People call me on my celly, so that's how people get a hold of me. Um, health insurance, personally I pay for my health insurance, which is ironic. And then we <laughs> donate to certain charities. So this is like a budget when we were first starting out. And this, if you're not a business person, don't worry, I'm not either. Business is just relationships. So you don't need an MBA to do this. You do not need an MBA to do this. But seriously, you're just um, doing a break-even analysis where your membership price is 50 bucks, costs $10 to take care of that person per month, and you can kind of see a break-even point. 
And then um, this is like with a higher expense. Say we added in rent for $2,000 and we hired a medical assistant for $3,000 a month. Your total monthly goes up to 9,500. And so like what does a break even analysis look like? How many patients do I need to have to break even, you know, to generate these sales, to break even on our costs and then make income afterwards, right? So personally, I would cap at like 500 members because I would be able to meet my income goal. Um, and by the way, at 500 members, how many patients am I seeing a day? Five patients a day, my man, right? And then I can start to love practicing medicine again, right? You know, I talk about numbers because it's important, but at the end of the day, I didn't do this to make a ton of money. I took a huge risk. I gave up two years of a full income. I did it because I believe that healthcare should be affordable and accessible for everyone. And I want to take care of people in a way that I can be proud of, right? I want to be able to offer my neighbor something that's really valuable. So what's it going to be? I'm going to take the leap? Anyways, this is more for my physician colleagues who are actually practicing. There's some good books out there. Their uh, member interest group in the AFP. Uh, here's some Instagram posts. There you go, Plum Health TPC. Me hanging out with my colleagues at the conference. There's one coming up in November that I'm going to. There's one in San Francisco in April that I go to every year. This is my office when I first started out. It was just a classroom at a school in Southwest Detroit. And uh, now we're making it happen. Look at that. That's fun. I dig that. Thanks so much for your time. Okay, we're going to open the floor to questions, right? And we'll do rapid fire. All right, over here. So uh, how do you deal with malpractice uh, events? Like, do you have to go through a separate third party for that? or? Yeah, you know, <laughs> it hasn't happened yet. But I think the malpractice risk should be lower in this model because I'm actually spending time with my patients and being accountable to them. And if somebody has a bad experience, they let me know. Doesn't happen often, but I had one patient tell me, it took you more than 24 hours to get back to my email. I'm sorry, man, how can I help you, right? So I think just being super accountable for my patients. And I think our reviews show that if you check us out on uh, Google or whatever, you can see we're pretty highly reviewed. All right, we'll go behind you. There was a question up there, yeah. So uh, the direct model Direct patient care model like kind of makes sense, primary care, but like what happens if like an uninsured patient, like don't, wouldn't you still need insurance to like be hospitalized or see a specialist? Because then your subscription wouldn't pay for that too, you know? Yes, that's correct. And no. Um, so I say I can take care of 80 to 90% of what you might need. I leverage this online tool called Rubicon MD. So if there's something that's slightly outside of my scope, we can write up a consult to a dermatologist, an endocrinologist, um, orthopedist, and we can include all the case details, the imaging, if pertinent, or the EKG, or a photo of the rash, and send that over and say, um, we had this injury, here's the x-ray, or we had a patient with palpitations, here's the EKG, or we had a patient with this funny rash, we think it's X, Y, and Z, what do you think? So that really ex allows me to expand my scope. And then if somebody needs to see a specialist, I've had uninsured patients who ask me, can we get a cash price? And so we'll call up the local orthopedist. And if they're independent, not a part of a large hospital system, we can typically get appointments for like $150 or $200. Or we, we can get special tests for those prices as well. Now for a hospitalization, truly catastrophic things, that's why you have insurance, right? And this is a little bit of a rant, but who here has an automobile? And who has auto insurance? You're mandated by the state of Michigan, right? You can't drive it without it. Who here calls Geico to put gas in their car? Who here calls Geico to change your tires or change your oil? Nobody, because it's the dumbest way to pay for primary care services for your car. It's insane, no one does that, right? You have insurance in the case of accidents and injuries, catastrophic events, that's what's insurance. That's what insurance is for. And when you start using your house insurance to buy paint, to paint your rooms, or use your house insurance to buy furniture, um, it's gonna inflate the cost of your insurance and it's gonna inflate the cost of everything in that marketplace. 
So what I tell folks is buy an insurance plan that you feel comfortable pairing with my membership. Now, about 30% of my patients are uninsured, and I understand that. So if they are hospitalized, that's a point where it's like, well, you have to sign up for charity care at this point, or work with their department, see if you can qualify for Medicaid, or something like that, right? This model is not perfect, but it is closer to the truth. There are some other hands, yeah. Um, I don't know how naive of a question this is, but why don't we have like a national EMR for like people to have like at all places? Sorry, can I laugh out loud about that? No, I, I completely agree. There should be one electronic medical record, but you're working in a capitalist system, which is America, which is great, but also bad. But you understand that these things are proprietary and like, Certain hospital systems don't want you to leave their system, so they make it really difficult to transfer your records. And so there's no cross-communication, and it's intentional, because once you're in hospital system X, which I will not name, you cannot go to hospital system Y, because it's too much of a pain to get your records released. And so virtually every patient, I'm doing a records release and waiting a couple months to get their expletive medical records. And it really hurts my ability to provide excellent patient care because it's like proprietary and they want to hold on to it. So that's why, because they make more money that way. I know you said um, like in the money model, you make like 100% of what the patient's paying. Do you have support staff? Do you have nurses and MAs or anything working with I you? I don't, why? I can draw blood, I can give injections, I can count pills, I can dispense them from my pharmacy. Um, I can write notes. It's, it's an efficient system. Now, when I grow and say we have two doctors, yeah, I'd love to hire a nurse and bring someone on. And then that's in business, it's called scaling. So we earn more revenue together so we can afford for higher overhead. But hopefully the overhead is always less than 25% of the revenue or like 33% of the revenue, right? That's like the target 25, 33% of the revenue. It goes to overhead, and that keeps us super efficient, super lean, super profitable. So um, the way your model works in providing uh, like the level of personal care mm -hmm. is due to you changing the incentives, right? So it's not how many patients you see a day, mm -hmm. and it's also because you limit your patient load? Yes, that's correct. Uh, white jacket in the back. Do you find that there's any legislation going forward that's trying to direct it towards direct primary care? Yeah, so there's actually a, a law passed in the state of Michigan. So direct primary care was never illegal, but in certain states it's spelled out in the law. In Michigan, fortunately, it is spelled out in our books. Um, it was legislation passed in, I think, 2015 by Patrick Kolbeck and the legislature. So it's on the books. It makes it really simple. It just states what you need to have Basically, you have to yell at people when they come in that this is not insurance, right? Because you can't say, I can't say that this is an insurance plan. It's not. It's healthcare, right? There's a difference between health insurance and healthcare. I'm healthcare. What you get from those other guys is health insurance, right? Got another one over here. Um, I'm wondering, what is the demographic of patients that you see at your practice? Like, is this mostly like uninsured lower class people or is this for the higher class uh, citizens? Yeah. Um, what socioeconomic status? And it's really across the board. So we see folks who, I, I say anybody who has an info, income can afford our service. Anyone who has an income can afford our service. And so we have folks who are returning from prison who can't get insurance, who are um, teachers down the street who uh, have great insurance through their school systems but don't have access to health care. Um, we have folks who own family businesses who are high six-figure, maybe seven-figure earners who have platinum Blue Cross Blue Shield and they call their doctor on Monday morning at 10 a.m. and they say, I think I have bronchitis, I'd like to be seen. And they say, how's Friday? So then uh, he sends me a text message at 10 a.m. and I say, how's 11 a.m.? And he says, perfect. He's my member. He has been since that time last year, right? 
So that's where we provide a ton of value. And it depends. It has different value for different people. We also serve small businesses, as I mentioned before. If you have more than 50 full-time equivalents, that is 50 full-time employees, you have to provide health insurance. Under 50, you don't. So a lot of those folks want to provide some sort of health care service for their employees. That's why they contract with us. So it's really the gamut. And 65% uh, probably have insurance. Probably 30 to 35% are uninsured. All right, blue shirt, purple tie. You had a question? I, uh, I did. Uh, I guess I was sort of uh, confused on how you're able to offer the actual price of medications and x-rays. And then we don't mark it up. We buy it from the wholesaler that the big box retailers, which I shall not name, uh, do. Um, you know, you know the, who I'm talking about. And you know, Walmart gives away free medications, right? There's the free list, so you know they're cheap. You know they're cheap. Everybody knows they're cheap. But you have to go to the back corner of Walmart to pick them up. So then, what do you do on your way back? You buy like thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred dollars worth of Walmart stuff that you didn't need, and that's how they make money on their prescriptions. Other people do it. I just don't make my money on prescriptions. I break even on my prescripts. And then there's also third-party imaging centers like Regional Medical Imaging or Bosch Diagnostics, and they offer cash prices because they're operating the free market. They don't want to have their scanner having downtime, so people can come in and pay for the cost of the service. Purple shirt. How did you initially build your patient population? Um, guerrilla marketing. So. I took some small business classes in Detroit. I started a Facebook page. I wrote a blog. I shared that content across my social media channels. Um, and I wrote opinion pieces in the Detroit News. I was featured in Crane's Detroit Business. And then it started to become like a snowball. And then we got interviewed on Channel 4 News. Tonight, we're going to be featured on Channel 7 News, tonight at 11. <laughs> Are you paying too much for your health care? One revolutionary doctor in Southwest Detroit as he is. <laughs> Tonight at 11. You're welcome. I also do a pretty good Jerry Seinfeld. Um, so. Sorry. Uh, so I've heard that private practices are like slowly fading away and being bought out by like, hosp like hospitals and big corporations. Mm -hmm. I concur. Um, have you ever been like approached or threatened by hospitals about what you're doing and your success and all that? No, they don't know about me yet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Threatened. I did meet with some C-suite people at you know, Hospital X, and I said, listen, I know you're getting killed on your 30-day readmission rates. right?" So if somebody goes in for COPD and they have an exacerbation, the hospital gets paid for the first visit. But if they come back within 30 days, they don't make any money. right? So I'm like, I know you're getting killed. I know you don't have the primary care resource in the city. Send some people my way. No, you're not a hospital X physician. Sorry. Right? Um, but you're right. Hos uh, small practices are getting consolidated because there's so many quality metrics, meaningless use, oh, sorry, meaningful use <laughs> milestones that they have to meet, right? All the documentation requirements. So they're really being pushed out. And a lot of that legislation, like MACRA and MIPS, it really favors large households hospital systems. They did a study and they showed that for single solo practitioners, you had a 4% chance of making money in macro, a 96% chance of losing money in macro, versus it was flipped for like if you had a practice of 100 or more. But it's really unfortunate because they've done studies that show if you have a private practice physician, you often get better care, lower morbidity and mortality, right? Because it's more, they more have a direct relationship. They're not putting off the responsibility to one of their 98 other partners. So critics of direct primary care would say, hey, you're cutting your patient panel from 2,000 to 500. Mm -hmm. Isn't this exacerbating the access problem? Is there anything that you can do to really address that beyond adding, say, ancillary staff like a PA, medical assistant, nurse, and then getting back to the impersonalization that caused this whole problem in the first place? Yeah. Well, I would answer that by saying, like, this is why I'm here. Right, because I believe in family medicine, and I believe in you to empower you to hopefully make this decision that you want to do something more or less in the free market and actually take care of people and not insurance companies. Right, so I'm trying to lead by example and 
create a valuable practice um, that's joyful. And I can honestly say that most days I'm pretty happy with what I do. And I love working with students and uh, speaking at events like this because I believe that this is the future uh, or this is the better future right, for medicine. Um, so the real answer to that is we need more doctors to take up the mantle and be a part of the movement. And so I do a lot of speaking, educating, I'm writing books to try to help people transition to this model. Um, how closely do you engage with like preventive care? Do you do like nutrition counseling or lifestyle counseling for your patients? Every day. Always ask if they have had, you know, their pap smear or their colonoscopy or their mammogram. Um, uh, counseling about immunizations. We ask every patient if you need your flu shot or your Tdap up to date. Flu shots are sixteen dollars and thirty two cents. Tdaps are forty four dollars and fifty cents or something like that, right? So we try, uh, pap smear is $33, and I don't charge anything to perform it, but the pathologist will charge $33 to read it. Um, like we do skin surveys, and we advise people about moles that look concerning, and we biopsy those at the time of, and it's $69. Again, I don't charge anything to do the biopsy, but the pathologist charges $64 to read it, and it costs $5 to ship it there, because they're in Idaho. So yeah, I engage in that stuff all the time. And I have folks who want to lose weight and quit smoking. And so I text them. On our way up here, um, I had a reminder in my electronic medical record that said, text Lauren and ask her to stop smoking. And so we did on the way up here. I was texting while driving. So no, no. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, who hasn't asked a question who wants to? OK, well, we'll go back to you. Do you find that it was hard to start it because you had to find all these resources to outsource to? Heck yes. Yeah, it's like climbing a mountain, right? You know, there's, uh, you can choose your peak. Like I could plateau right now and say, I've got 350 members, I really don't want to do any more work. But I want to grow. I want to reach that next pinnacle. And so it's always a challenge. And if you do anything valuable, it's going to be challenging because you have to blaze a trail and figure things out. Fortunately, there's a big enough movement and other physicians that we can talk with each other, share best practices and resources. And, um, you know, I, I spoke at the national conference um, for the AFP about branding and marketing your practice because I have a strong brand and like clean marketing. And so I tried to teach my colleagues how to roll that out for their own practices. You want over here. Um, I guess I have a couple questions. Uh, first, sure. like as a solo practice, mm -hmm. um, like are you literally always on call? And like, what do you feel your responsibility is to your patient when they call you at like two o'clock in the morning? Does that happen? Yeah, um, at two o'clock in the morning hasn't happened. I've had a nine p.m. on a Friday and an eleven p.m. on a Saturday. So the nine p.m. on a Friday, somebody who's working on their house put a drill into their thenar eminence, and I <laughs> sewed that up, and then. The 11 p.m. was uh, the young lady at the restaurant, and I stopped the bleeding there. So my obligation is to take care of them. Yeah. And then, um, because I didn't go to med school to work 9 to 5 and have a great lifestyle. I went to med school because I want to help people and be a great doctor. And part of that is showing up and being there. Um, OK, so that leads <clears throat> me to Sorry, I'll get off the so soapbox in a couple <laughs> seconds, right? That leads me to my second question. Um, yeah. It seems like you do a lot of your work over the phone and over text. Do you have certain like softwares in place to protect HIPAA information on your cell phone? Yeah, I'm glad HIPAA came up because, you know, expletive HIPAA, right? Um, HIPAA is the worst, right? It was written in 1996 before we had emails and texting, right? And it's garbage, right? I have my patients, all my patients, waive my obligation to their HIPAA rights so that I can text and email them any information I want and vice versa. So they can, you know, I get some cool, interesting pictures, I'll leave it at that, every now and again. But it's sensitive, right? You know, if you have a lesion somewhere, you want to communicate with your doctor when the lesion is active, not 24 hours later when, you know, an appointment's available. So it empowers us to be able to provide the best sort of care, right? So where do you see this going 
on a macro scale. So let's say tomorrow yeah. you had 800 new physicians that want to do direct primary care. Where do you see this going? Yeah, so I believe in the independent physician to be empowered. You only need 500 patients to have a great income and live a great life and be really well respected by your patients and have fun. Dude, so I took it to this restaurant guy and he brought me uh, dumplings and some sake. It was really nice of him. Because <laughs> I came out at 11. And you know, it's a, it's a trust and a relationship. Sorry, that's micro level. Macro level is policies will change if this proves itself. I think it is already proving itself. And in some communities, like in Kansas, they've developed health insurance plans where it's truly catastrophic coverage, right? Or the health insurance company is paying or discounting the membership cost for their uh, enrollees who enroll in direct primary care because they're noticing 20% savings. They're making money by cutting $50 off the insurance premium each month, right? So I think different players in the marketplace are going to see the value over time, right? Because so that lady who cuts her finger, she goes to the hospital, she gets a bill for two grand, right? Or if she's insured, the insurance company gets a bill for two grand. So um, she's only paying $600 a month or $600 a year, $50 a month, right? So that insurance company just made $1,400 on me. They're going to realize that one day, hopefully, I hope. Yeah, one over here, sorry. So what happens when you're traveling, like, personally or just for work, like, at that time who takes care of the patients? Yeah, so that's happened. So my wife and I travel. Um, we went to Italy for a vacation. It was great. We were gone for 10 days. So email, I emailed everybody before I left, a month before. Hey, I'm going out of town. Two weeks before. I'm going out of town in two weeks. One week before. So I just try to get everybody to make their appointment before I leave. And then the day before I leave and the day after are crazy, you know, a few days with a lot more patients than typical. But if somebody does need to go to an urgent care, I would refund them their monthly membership, right? Because I couldn't fulfill my obligation. So I'll give that money back to you. It's happened one time, right? Where somebody really needed to go. <clears throat> and also I have Google Voice, which is international. So um, I'll get up early and take care of my patients' emails, call in scripts. Um, I usually spend an hour each day on vacation taking care of my patients. But you know that's the point of scaling. I'd love to bring on another doctor so I don't have to be as intense about it. Yeah, good question. Do you have any other requirements for your patients besides meeting the monthly fee? What do you mean? Like, do they have to do certain things in order to stay a member, or no. do they have to be like a U.S. citizen? Do they no. have to have a job? No, no, no. And we take care of a lot of uh, immigrants who are undocumented because it's their only access point for health care, right? They only need to have $49 a month to be a part of the membership. So we do take care of folks like that. Yeah. What would you say to the business averse among us who get huh. excited by this concept but are kind of apprehensive about um, the accounting, billing, uh, marketing aspects of all of this? Dude, it's so easy. I mean, it's not so easy, but like you're a medical student, right? You That means you had more, greater than a 3.5 in, in undergrad and you passed the MCAT with flying colors and you matriculated, you're still standing. You know, if you make it through residency, you're gonna have to take umpteen more tests and you're smart enough, you're strong enough, you're, you're durable enough, you have the, the wherewithal to get this done. And if you believe in the dream of starting your practice, then you're gonna find a way to do it. And, and you're a millennial, right? So you know how to leverage Facebook and Instagram to tell people about what you're doing. And it, re it really is only storytelling. It's like, I'm just telling a story on my social media channels about what I'm doing. I had the pleasure of speaking with medical students about at, at uh, Oakland University who are excited about direct primary care. The movement is growing, <laughs> right? It's, it's cheesy a little bit, but it's effective. And it's not that difficult. And, and you get QuickBooks, which is an accounting software. And it tracks all of your expenses that you use on your business credit or debit card or checking account. 
And then uh, your accountant can go in on the back end and run your audit for the year and make sure you're paying your taxes appropriately. Right? It's, it's nothing crazy. Legally, I paid somebody um, you know, a few thousand dollars to set up the contracts. So it was a big expense starting out, but it wasn't difficult. I just had to pay the money. <clears throat> so uh, you had a question in the gingham. Is that gingham? OK, great. You and the gingham. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Okay. Your, shirt, your shirt pattern. OK, OK. <laughs> um, do you, my question was, uh, do you see any possible future of uh, this kind of model being used in uh, specialist offices? Um, yes and no. You'd have to provide a really high level of service for your folks. And uh, you'd have to have enough recurring people who are seeing you all the time, perhaps nephrology, cardiology. Yeah. You had a question. You in the blue. Oxford cloth button down. <laughs> I, I forgot it. OK. <laughs> Just done. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's always a risk in business. There could be a downturn. You don't know how people are going to react. They might say, I'm going to cut all my non-essential expenses. I send them a text message. I'm like, bro, what's up? You missed your appointment. Where are you? It's 10.05. No. Oh, yeah, so um, they can <laughs> They cancel an appointment, it's great. I just get to, you know, write a blog post or something in that time. <laughs> but uh, if they cancel the membership, great. I, you know, they're communicating with me. The worst thing is, like, I, I bill out on the first of the month. The worst thing is somebody who sends me an email right after is like, I didn't, I was, I wanted to cancel, but I didn't. I was like, oh. so now you want a refund. That's kind of annoying. But the folks who are like, I had somebody email me today. It happens about five times each month. Somebody, it doesn't work out, they move, they change jobs, they lose insurance, they gain insurance, they, something happens. Baby is born, whatever. Um, great. I love that you love using our service for the three months or the five months of the year that you were with us. I'm going to miss you. If I can ever do anything for you in the future, let me know. I'll be here for you. Yeah, so if somebody tries to do that, it happens like maybe one or two people have tried to do that. Can I just like come on for May and then August and then January? No, because it's really unfair to the other people. If you cancel and you want to come back, I would charge a re-enrollment fee of like 100 bucks, just to make sure that you're in. I want you to be in, all in on the service. Because obviously like I'm all in on taking care of my patients. And I think it reflects... Like I said, in our reviews that people have for our service, because um, we really provide a high level of service. And I tell people when they sign up, if you ever don't love the service, let me know. And we'll close out your account. If you ever don't need it, just let me know. Got it. Got it. Came back. Uh, so is your membership fee like a uh, flat rate for everybody, the same, same rate for everybody? $10 a month for kids. $49 a month if you're under 40, 69 if you're over 40, and 89 if you're over 65. I tier it like that because older people need more services, typically. And then, like, how did you come up with those numbers? Gut feeling. <laughs> yeah. So I visited a doctor who was doing 50, 75, 100 in Wichita. I think their economy is a little bit stronger than southwest Detroit. If I were doing it in Oakland County, I'd charge more. If I were in Birmingham or Gross Point, I'd charge more. Um, but also, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I realize, you know, just talking about race, ethnicity, where I am in the world, um, I'm a white doctor practicing in southwest Detroit. Detroit's 85% African American. Um, and I respect and understand that. So I really wanted to create a service 
that could be valuable for any resident in the city of Detroit. So, and we've achieved that. So, you know, I've, I, I make house calls for a gentleman who lives on the west side of Detroit who is, has some paralysis in his lower extremities, can't get out of bed, but this is affordable for them and their family. So, um, we have a 91 year old woman who's lived in southwest Detroit her whole life. And we've made house calls for her and it's valuable for her because she can more or less be to the doctor in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> what would you say is like a categorical breakdown of like the most common ailments that you deal with? It's the same thing as in primary care. You know, back pain, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, wrist pain. Um, <clears throat> Madison, help me out here. Allergies, asthma. Um, people just want to check their thyroid levels. The young healthy guy who, or gal who works for a company and they need their physical and routine blood work. Kind of stuff. Um, moms with babies. I get a couple anti-vaxxers who come in who are like, I like you because you're not gonna force me to do anything I don't wanna do. And of course I encourage them to get vaccines because I believe in vaccines and herd immunity and all of that. But you know, I'm also operating the free market so I respect the, the individual's choice so I don't force anything. Um, do you have any competitors offering like the similar service? And if not, like if a competitor does come in and offer the same services as you, but like at a lower cost because they have more doctors, what are you going to do about that? I think we're valuable and I think our value speaks for itself and our members speak for our value. Um, so yeah, it can happen to any business like Netflix, what Netflix did to Blockbuster, right? Um, uh, but I think we deliver a valuable service that's not not going to change with a competitor. And I think the market is big enough for other competitors. And I look at other direct primary care doctors who do this as a rising tide helping all ships. Because then more people know about it. More people are talking about direct primary care. When this thing airs on Channel 7, it's going to help my friend in Brighton. It's going to help my friend in Rochester because they're part of that market. And people are going to search direct primary care near me into Google. And if they have worked on their search engine optimization, they will float to the top. Um, what I know that won't undercut me, which is the strategy of certain large hospital system uh, affiliated with this institution, um, <laughs> is putting up more urgent care centers. Right? Their answer to what I'm doing in the marketplace is to create more urgent care centers. Um, and I see urgent care as low value, low value, high volume. I'm the opposite, I'm high value, low volume. And I think consumers in the marketplace are smart enough to know that going to see uh, one, one provider in one urgent care and having them send the records to your other doctor in the fee-for-service system isn't the same as having one doctor who can take care of all of it for you in a timely manner via text message or email or Skype. I was just curious how you uh, felt it compared if you just did a reduced cost pay for service that was just directly for you. Or did you think about that at all when you came up with this? Uh, thought you were going to pursue it? Yeah, I think the recurring revenue models, Netflix of the world, uh, what else you got? Spotify. What other recurring services are you guys using and just not blanking about? Apple Music. Amazon. What else? I think those, those business models are really successful for a reason. It's because $49 a month isn't that much money. I mean, it's a lot of money. It's not that much money to have a high quality doctor on call for you 24 seven. And um, <clears throat> people don't wanna pay over and above their health insurance when they go to see the doctor. That's like charging a ridiculous copay. And that's what's driving people to my model. Who's, who's amped up? Did I piss anybody off today? <laughs> Is anybody really excited about the future now? Yeah, you got a question over here. Have you had to adjust, I guess, your own personal finances in order to accommodate? I, got, I don't know, because I don't know how much you're making, but. Sure. Um, so when I started out, 
I was um, working at urgent care two days a week, um, one weekday and one weekend day, and then I'd be at the Plum Health the four other weekdays. And so I was earning about $5,000 a month doing that, making 70 hours, seventy dollars an hour working 20 hours. And my student loan balance when I graduated was 170, 170K. And my payments, I'm on a ten, straight 10 year repayment, so two, 2K a month I pay for that. So I was living off of three grand a month. In residency, I was making three grand after taxes. So I was living off a grand and spending two grand on student loans. Something to look forward to, folks. No, but um, uh, in the model now, I'm getting closer to a f full physician salary um, at 350 members. And it's, it gets exciting when you scale and bring on other people because then uh, the income shifts higher. You said that your goal was 500. Are you at that? I'm at 350. Yep, yeah, 350 folks. Yep. Do you see a decrease in onboarding of new patients? Have you seen that as you've gone more? No, no it's like more like a snowball. So I'm actively looking to bring somebody else on. Yeah. How often do you feel like you're uh, like stretching your scope of practice since you're practicing independently as opposed to if you were part of a big system where referrals would be, in theory, easier? Yeah, so that's a, that's a wonderful question. It's tough to say. Um, I mean... I'm always learning new things, and I'm always pushing myself because I want to be the best physician possible. So I spend a lot of my downtime reading. And so if I see five patients in a day, I might spend four hours doing patient care, and then the other, you know, an hour doing marketing, and two hours, you know, reading about medicine or following up on labs and stuff. So I'm stretching my scope of practice every day, but I think that's, if I felt unsafe, I'd make the referral. And so like, we just got a, uh, we did routine labs. We got a comprehensive metabolic panel. Young ladies, she's 65. Young ladies, um, kidney function, GFR was 24, 26. So I'm no question referring her to nephrology right away. No hesitation. Now, if it's 60 or 55, we can do like an e-consult and say, our patient's GFR is this, and they have this history, and we're using these medications. How does this look? What other tests might you might you uh, recommend we obtain? That's through the e-consult platform. Then I can go in and you know, do those things and make sure I'm feeling comfortable with it. Reconsult once we have all those results and make sure we're on a steady course with that person with CKD. Yeah, so that, that's an example of scope of practice. Now, if, if this young lady on Saturday truly cut her finger off, there's no question, go to the ER. You, you need me to stop the bleeding, I got you. What is the phrase, I got you, fam? <laughs> family medicine. Fam for family medicine. <laughs> okay, great. Cool? Capiche? Caprese? I've got some business cards if you want them. And thank you so much. This is great. I don't know if you need these. I don't know if you need or want these, but... Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Sorry for all the questions. Oh, no. I was an econ major, so... Happy to help. All this stuff, yeah. Thanks a lot. I really like the idea. Thanks.